The title of this experiment is Patterns in Molecular Structure and Shape, and it really focuses on drawing and interpreting Lewis structures, which are molecular level representations of the structures of chemical compounds. Typically, in an introductory chemistry course, drawing Lewis structures focuses on being given a chemical formula and drawing the structure from that. But I'm actually not a big fan of this kind of problem because it's not a very well formed and well uh, understood, quite frankly, type of problem. It's not easy for an introductory student to get a handle on it. And in fact, it isn't what expert chemists do, which is the main thing that frustrates me about it. Actually, the main thing that expert chemists do is interpret given structures and expand abbreviations. And that's really where we focus our attention in this experiment in terms of drawing Lewis structures. Rather than drawing a structure from scratch with absolutely no information, it's much more common for a practicing chemist to have to expand a given substructure. So for example, here we see CO2H embedded within this structure. This is a substructure found within this molecule. This molecule, by the way, is the drug Lyrica. This is one of the top selling drugs in the United States, at least as of this video recording. And to really understand what's going on with the CO2H group, it's important for us to be able to expand it into a full Lewis structure to see how things are connected, where the double and triple bonds are, where the non-bonding lone pairs are, that kind of thing. And that's where the first part of this experiment focuses. And so just to continue with this example of Lyrica and this highlighted group here, this is called a carboxylic acid. And we can take this group and really blow it up into its constituent atoms. One thing that we can tell immediately from this is that the carbon is connected to this atom here, which is an implied carbon atom with two hydrogens connected to it. This carbon is connected to this carbon. We can tell that because the C is adjacent to this line indicating a single bond. So to begin to expand this structure, we can start by drawing that C just connected via a single line to the rest of the structure, which we could represent just with a squiggly line here. Now in terms of the two oxygens and the remaining hydrogen, it's not actually entirely clear how we expand this. We could do this a couple of different ways by connecting the two oxygens together and then putting a hydrogen on the end. Or we could imagine um, putting one oxygen here and one oxygen here and connecting hydrogen this way. And if we think through how we would have to add additional electrons here and the fact that we have no atoms left, we would realize that a big problem comes in at this carbon, which is violating the octet rule in the structure drawn this way. And this tells us that this first connectivity that we drew is not the connectivity of this group. These are decisions that you'll have to make as you work through this um, experiment. And they're important decisions to make. They're decisions that practicing chemists make all the time when interpreting abbreviations. So let's assume that this is the so-called sigma skeleton or skeletal structure of this functional group. And now we have to figure out how to add electrons onto this. We could start, for example, by adding lone pairs to this oxygen atom to satisfy the octet rule and lone pairs to this oxygen to satisfy the octet rule. This looks good, except this carbon is violating the octet rule. And we have formal charge issues since this carbon is formally positive and this oxygen formally negative. To fix this situation, we can simply erase this non-bonding pair of electrons on oxygen and create a double bond here. Now everything's looking good. Everything's satisfying the octet rule. So in the first part of the experiment, you'll work through a number of these abbreviated structures found primarily within molecules of pharmaceutical interest and expand them into full Lewis structures containing multiple bonds and lone pairs like this. In the second part of the experiment, you'll begin interpreting these expanded Lewis structures to draw interesting conclusions or recognize interesting things about the atoms involved in the structure. The first thing we'll look at is the geometry. From a given Lewis structure, through the use of Vesper theory, we can infer the arrangement of electrons in space around each atom and the molecular geometry that results. The basic idea behind this, the basic starting point, is to first focus our attention on one of the atoms. And here in the carboxylic acid functional group, we're going to focus on the carbon, which is kind of the most central of the atoms. And we want to identify the number of so-called electron pair domains in this thing. And electron pair domains 
has a variety of different names, electron pair domains, electron domains, charge clouds. These are regions of space where electrons reside, kind of common regions of space for different groups of electrons. And each double or triple bond counts as a single domain, as do pairs of non-bonding electrons and single bonds. And so if we focus on this carbon, we can see that we have one, two, three electron pair domains around that carbon. By applying Vesper theory, we can go immediately from that number of electron pair domains to what I like to call the electron group arrangement. And this is essentially the arrangement of the electron pair domains around the central atom in space. This is directly implied by the number of electron pair domains based on the Vesper principle. And here, the electron group arrangement based on three domains is trigonal planar. The electron group arrangement doesn't really pay attention to whether the electron domain is a bond or a lone pair. When we start paying attention to that, or we start just asking where the atoms located in space, kind of ignoring the positions of the lone pairs on some level, we're asking a question now about the molecular geometry about that central atom. And so the idea behind molecular geometry really is just where are the atoms in space based on the electron group arrangement and the number of non-bonding lone pairs linked to the central atom. Now this carbon has no non-bonding lone pairs linked to it. From that, we can immediately conclude that its molecular geometry is also trigonal planar. In the second part of this experiment, you'll identify the number of electron pair domains, bonding and non-bonding, and then infer the electron group arrangements and molecular geometries for these substructures that we drew in part A. In the next stage of the experiment, we'll determine whether the functional group is polar or nonpolar and get a rough idea for the direction of the dipole moment if the structure is polar. Recall that by polarity, we mean a situation within a molecule in which one side or one end of the molecule has net positive charge due to a lack of electrons and the other end of the molecule has a net negative charge due to an excess of electrons. This sets up a situation with partial positive charge on one end and partial negative charge on the other end, and we can represent that using either these delta plus and delta minus symbols or using an arrow with a cross on one end to indicate the positively charged end. This is a so-called dipole vector. In part C of the experiment, we're going to again interpret our full Lewis structure from part A, this time using the full Lewis structure to determine whether the functional group is polar or nonpolar. And we're going to do that by first analyzing the bond dipoles. So a very systematic way to analyze polarity involves looking at the electronegativities of linked atoms and deciding where the electrons are within each pair of bonded atoms. So for example, we could look at carbon and oxygen and the carbon-oxygen double bond and ask which of these two atoms is more electronegative. Well, oxygen being more electronegative will tend to pull electrons towards itself or tend to hold on to a larger electron density. And this implies that the carbon-oxygen bond is polarized toward oxygen with negative charge on the oxygen end and positive charge on the carbon end. And in fact, the same is true of the other carbon-oxygen bond, the carbon-oxygen single bond is polarized toward oxygen with the positive end at carbon and the negative end at oxygen. Finally, we can look at the oxygen-hydrogen bond and again ask about electronegativity, which is more electronegative, oxygen or hydrogen? Well, oxygen is quite a bit more electronegative than hydrogen, and so this bond will be polarized toward the oxygen. From these three bond dipole vectors, we can get a sense of the overall dipole vector just by adding the bond dipoles. And let's actually draw that overall dipole vector in purple so that we can distinguish it from the individual bond dipole vectors. So roughly speaking, if we were to add these three vectors together, we would get a resultant vector that's somewhat in this general direction. And this purple vector, roughly speaking, represents the overall polarity of the functional group. Because of the length of that vector, the fact that it is definitely non-zero due to these strong bond dipoles, this tells us that the functional group overall is most definitely polar. And one last thing I'll mention about this determining polarity is that we've essentially ignored the influence of whatever this functional group is attached to because this is typically carbon, which is more or less electroneutral in most cases. 
If a strongly electronegative atom like oxygen or nitrogen is connected here, it may be worth considering. But in this case, where we had just carbon connected to carbon, we could safely ignore it. So in part C of the experiment, you'll determine bond dipoles and an overall dipole vector, roughly speaking, for each functional group that we drew in part A. And you'll determine whether the functional groups overall are polar or nonpolar. A very important determination for reasoning about properties that are based on whether the molecule as a whole is polar or nonpolar. Finally, in part D of the experiment, we'll explore the hybridization of the central atom within each functional group. And so as we did previously when looking at the geometry, we're going to focus our attention here on the central carbon atom. Now, hybridization, you should recall, is an orbital concept involving a modified or hybrid set of atomic orbitals used to make bonds to the atoms that surround the central atom. Hybridization is a way of describing the orbital overlap in valence bond theory terms that leads to the bonds that we see in the Lewis structure. Because the central atom only needs enough hybrid atomic orbitals to hold the electrons in the electron pair domains that surround it, the number of electron pair domains can be used to directly reason about the hybridization in most cases. And that's certainly the case here and in all the functional groups you'll see in this experiment. We previously determined that this carbon atom is surrounded by three electron pair domains. This means that that carbon atom is associated with three hybrid orbitals. In essence, one is involved in this bond to the doubly bonded oxygen, one is involved in this bond to the singly bonded oxygen, and one is involved to the bond to the carbon atom that's kind of off screen right here. So we need three hybrid orbitals or hybrid atomic orbitals here. At this point, we apply the idea that when hybridizing, the number of atomic orbitals in is equal to the number of hybrid atomic orbitals out. And the atomic orbitals here refers to the valence atomic orbitals which are involved in bonding. And so carbon, being in the second row of the periodic table, has valence orbitals that include the 2s, 2px, 2py, and 2pz atomic orbitals. Because we only need three hybrid atomic orbitals to form these three bonds or three electron pair domains, if you like, we only need to use the 2s and 2 of the 2p orbitals, let's say the 2px and 2py, it actually doesn't matter which two we choose, to form the hybrids. This means that the hybrids are constructed by mixing an s and 2p orbitals, and we represent that using s, p, and a superscript 2. In conclusion, we say that the hybridization of this carbon atom within this structure with three electron pair domains associated with it is sp2. Each of the hybrids involved in a sigma bond to oxygen, oxygen, and carbon can be called an sp2 hybrid. So in the last part of the experiment, you'll work out the hybridization of the central atom in each of those substructures that we drew in part A. And this is an important interpreted result of the full Lewis structure. Hybridization gives us insight into the nature of electrons around the central atom, their energies, their reactivity, and their locations in space.